Hello, Global Gardeners. Hope you had a great weekend. And I hope you have a great beginning to your gardening week. And let's get it started by talking about gardening. What a great way to start the week. So nice to see everybody checking in from all over. And today I want to talk about gardeners. You. Gardeners are amazing people. You've heard me say this before. I am so thankful for all of you. I think gardeners are among the nicest people on the planet. But I also think gardeners are tough. They're resilient. Gardeners are really a special breed of people because while too many people, I think, think gardening is easy, those of us that are actually doing it recognize that it's hard. It's a challenge. Things go wrong. And so that's what I want to focus on today is what makes gardeners special because we're so resilient and so tough and so nice and helpful and gracious in the process. What got me thinking about this are a few different things. One, this is the kind, this is the time of year as we enter September when things really begin to change in our gardens. For many of us, it means the end of summer, fall approaches, the cold weather, the end of the gardening season. And for others on the other side of the planet, it's just the opposite. It is the end of winter. It's the beginning of spring. It's the challenge of getting that garden started and moving into a new growing season. And as gardeners, that's an interesting dichotomy that we have depending on the time of year. It seems like we're always getting our garden ready and then it's never long enough that we actually have time in our garden before everything starts to fade and winter approaches. But we keep doing it. That's where the toughness and the resilience comes in. We keep doing it because of those brief periods when we can enjoy everything there is about gardening. The background today is my garden. I took this picture this morning just after sunrise. And for those of you who have seen my videos and are regular viewers, you know that most of the year for me here in Colorado, I don't have a nice green, luscious garden. Most of the year, it's brown. The plants are dead or dormant, and it's only a brief time in August, generally, for a couple weeks when everything is at its peak. And that's where it's at right now for me in my garden, at my peak, and I absolutely love it. I'm harvesting tomatoes. I'm enjoying the time I'm spending in the garden. But I know in just a few short weeks, it's going to fade. But that doesn't matter. It's the now. It's enjoying the garden today that really gets my attention. And so I know you've heard these words before. I came across them recently <coughs> and I thought it would be really appropriate to highlight words that weren't spoken to gardeners, but I think really are important to identify for ourselves and to others what being a gardener is all about. And these words were written over a hundred years ago. They come from Teddy Roosevelt. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end a triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. 
And you may not have thought of these words in relationship to gardening before, but I think they are so true. There aren't many people who are willing, who have a desire or are even capable of going out, taking a bare patch of ground and growing a garden. They know it's going to fail. How many times have you heard someone say that they don't garden because it's too hard? I've heard that many, many times. The people who say they've tried it, but they didn't like it because it was too difficult. Those aren't the gladiators of gardening. Those aren't the warriors. It's you, the ones who keep doing it day by day, month by month, year by year, in the good seasons, in the bad seasons, because you are in the arena. Our arenas are our gardens. And it's, it's one of those things that I talk a lot about, the garden being a quiet place, a peaceful place, a place that I enjoy spending time. But it's also a place where we're doing battle. We're battling the pests. We're battling the weather. We're battling individual plants that just don't grow the way we want them to grow. But we're there. We are in the arena. And we know that there's going to be those failures. That's all part of gardening. But we also know there's going to be those victories, those successes. And so today, I'd like the focus to be on you, those of you who are in your garden arena as a gladiator confronting all the battles you have. And this year has been very difficult for many of us with extreme heat or with extreme rain or with wildfires or with hurricanes. There's been a lot that have devastated our gardens, but you're here today with me and all the rest of us as we continue on our gardening journey because we're not going to let those setbacks affect us. We're going to keep going because we're battling regardless of what anybody else says, regardless of the criticisms others have of our garden, our produce, our methods, whatever it happens to be, at least we're the ones that are making the effort and are fighting valiantly to have gardening as part of our lives and making the best of it. So a salute to all of you for being gardeners and for being here today so that we can continue this journey together and share all that we have. And Gardens Happen says, looks like I have a hurricane coming close to me in the next day or so. Yeah, I just saw that on the news today coming up through the Gulf of Mexico, going to hit the west coast of florida you just never know what you're going to get gail saying got three inches of rain this weekend there's always those extremes but it continues and it's one of those things that we're gonna go out we're gonna reclaim our garden you, you can see if you look at this picture behind me the top leaves the oldest leaves have holes in them and damage from a hailstorm i had a couple weeks ago but you look underneath and you see new green growth and everything that's growing new doesn't know that there was a storm a couple weeks ago it's that new growth for both the gardener and the plants that really helps sustain sustain us as we move forward sherry says i often say i'm 116 pounds of raw raging power i think that's fantastic yeah it's it's all mental it's our attitude. It's how we approach gardening, regardless of our size, of our age, of our ability. Just by getting out there and doing it, I think, says so much about our character as gardeners. <clears throat> and you might guess, as a big YouTube channel, I get comments occasionally, not often, but occasionally from people who obviously aren't gardeners, who are criticizing what I say in a video or what my garden looks like, especially during those brown times. And I'm okay with that because gardeners aren't so critical of other gardeners because they've gone through those battles. So when I get some of those criticisms, I just think how sad that person 
is not a gardener. They're not in the arena. It's easy for them to be a critic because they've never fought those battles. <coughs> Sunset Gazing, a member for five months now. Awesome. Happy Monday. We got rain. The lawn and plants have perked up. It's the simple things in life. So stop and smell the roses. Absolutely. And, you know, one thing about being a gardener, you've heard that so many times. Stop and smell the roses. Well, as a gardener, we can grow roses so that literally we can stop and smell the roses. And so it's so much of our, our society uses a phrase like that in other ways to just tell people to slow down in life and to enjoy their life. But it comes from the garden because ultimately gardening really does have a basis in a lot of our lives and how we lead our lives outside of the garden. Hello, Masabi gals. I get my greenhouse prepared, prepared for winter. I'm wondering if I should empty the water barrels because we have such cold winters here in Minnesota, minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is also minus 40 degrees Celsius. <coughs> so I, it, it takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of cold to freeze the amount of water in, in a big barrel. I'm assuming they're probably the 40 gallon barrels. And so if, if you keep your greenhouse closed and depending on how much water you're talking about, I would suggest, this is what I'm doing this winter, I would suggest monitoring the temperature and not draining the barrels so that you can see what difference the water makes in your greenhouse. They should never freeze. So and at the Galileo Garden, the, the big greenhouse we had had the big water pond in the greenhouse and it was used to help moderate the temperature in the greenhouse. And we had temperatures regularly here in, in my part of Colorado that were down to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, which puts us at about uh, minus 29 Celsius. Never had frost around that water, never had a glazing of ice. The temperature in the greenhouse would drop below freezing. It would get to just above 20 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about minus seven Celsius. And the water never iced up because of thermodynamics and the way energy works. It takes a lot of energy for water to move from the liquid stage to the frozen stage. So it, it's, chances are that it's not going to freeze and that those barrels are going to retain heat and be okay. But I'll leave that up to you. I think it's something is worth a try. I'm definitely going to try it and I'm not worried about it at all. Now, my winters are not as cold as yours, but particularly if you want to be a greenhouse grower and understand how the water works to warm your greenhouse in cold temperature, it might be something that you would move forward to move forward with and see how it works out. Sherry says people who criticize without experience don't get a vote. I agree with that wholeheartedly. And Bud's saying, I believe we need to be mental gladiators most of all. Good point. Always pushing forward with optimism and confidence. Every problem is temporary. Absolutely. And that's why I think gardeners really are special because that's how most of us approach it. Not everything. There are things in life that are just hard and how we approach them varies from person to person. But I completely agree that it's so much of a mental challenge in life and the garden really helps us confront those challenges because we're warriors, because we're garden gladiators, because we've had adversity out in nature. A lot of the rest of the stuff just is easy to deal with. Jeremy Ransom says, I watched the latest tomato episode. Thank you for that. One nice thing about growing basil with tomatoes is that you can, is that it can help identify if you have any hornworms by the basil leaves catching their droppings. That's a real good point. And I didn't talk about that in the video. I've actually been thinking about trying to make a video on that subject uh, using plants and other plants to identify 
or help with the pests that you have in your garden. And you're exactly right. Basil is, is a plant that is more susceptible to some of those insect pests than the tomatoes. So when those pests appear, you're probably going to see them on the basil before you see them on the tomato plants, which gives you time to, to deal with it. I did a trip to France years ago to visit the vineyards, and in many of the vineyards in France, they have rose bushes that are planted at the ends of the rows in the vineyard for the same reason. The rose is going to be the first one that is attacked by pest and disease, and so they can be ready for it. In my large enclosed garden, I'm letting a lot of the, the, the weeds and, and native flowers grow. And I just noticed this week that in one section, some of those plants are, are infested with, with aphids. I don't have aphids anywhere else in my garden, but that's the first spot they attack, which gives me the opportunity to be aware that there's aphids in the area and as long as I've got the ladybugs and the lacewings and all the other predators, everything's okay. So you're exactly right. Putting some of those plants in your garden, the, the one that has really worked well for me is turnips. When I grow turnips, I've had um, the, the pirate bugs, I've had the aphids, I've had all kinds of different insect pests that show up and this was more so in the Galileo garden than my garden here. But the turnips were the plants that they attacked first and gave us time to come up with a plan for any problems in the other part of the, the garden. So thank you for that, Jeremy, because that really is a good idea to use other plants as a companion, but not for anything other than just pest control even though I do like the basil and I harvest the basil, but the idea being that it really does help the primary plant that you're trying to grow. A little colorblind gardener saying, when people ask me why I garden, I tell them it is the one thing you can do to literally enjoy the fruits of your labor. Absolutely. How much more literal can you be than enjoying the fruits of your labor? And again, that's one of those sayings that we use in life a lot that comes from the garden. So gardeners really do drive a lot of what we do in the rest of the world. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, it, it's sometimes difficult to, to quantify, to identify, to thoroughly explain what it is to be a gardener, particularly when you're talking with someone who isn't a gardener. I was in a social setting this last week and you know, wonderful conversations. Didn't talk a lot about gardening because the people in that situation weren't gardeners. And so I mentioned that I gardened and I had taken some of my delicious tomatoes to share with everybody and they liked the tomatoes, but there was no conversation about gardening because they didn't understand it. And, and it's like going to a doctor's convention or any other event where you don't have the same knowledge or experience or background as the other people. It works both ways. But when gardeners get together, we understand each other. And so it really does help to, to know, being a gardener, that all the other gardeners are going through the same issues, the same problems, the same kind of, of experiences that, in general, gardening gives all of us. Kathy is saying, if they're plastic barrels should be all right, even if they do freeze solid, no different than throwing a water bottle, bottle in the freezer. That's a good point. And actually I should mention, this is about the barrels in the greenhouse. When I filled my water barrels, I actually left space at the top so that if they did begin to freeze, if the water did expand in the cold, it wouldn't burst the barrels. And I have the plastic barrels and Again, that's why I'm not worried about it. But but yes, that's a good point. Um, if, if the barrels are filled to the brim, it could be a problem. But especially if they're plastic and if there's some airspace, then even if it freezes and the, the, the water expands, it should be okay. So um, take that for what it's worth. Might be something to experiment with. Ormelis says, I gardened at scale for the first time this year. 
I can assure you, you start off with as positive and as optimistic of a mental state as possible. Hit your bumps in the road and go from there. Good point. Yeah. At the the when you when you when you garden at scale, when I was at the Galileo Garden, we had a hundred and four raised beds. We typically wouldn't garden in more than about seventy-five or eighty, because that's all I could handle. But then you throw in everything else, and it's a different challenge. And it really is important to maintain that optimism if you can. But it can be a challenge. But when you when you uh, succeed, when you have a successful season, we had years when we were harvesting more than 2,000 pounds of produce. Even with all the challenges, you look back and you just know you were successful. You were in the arena fighting and you were victorious. You were the one that that came out and you knew the victory that no one else might necessarily know and i think that's a a special thing that that too few of us actually get the opportunity to experience so petrus nice to see you zone 13 africa zone 9 europe as we relocated as a decent gardener i became a novice gardening for ever learning Absolutely. We, we have talked about this in, in recent weeks. Uh, I mentioned the, the volunteers that I've worked with at the Galileo Garden those years ago who were master gardeners from other places and coming to my Colorado garden and having to relearn gardening and have to do things completely differently. And I can imagine moving from... Uh, zone 13 africa to zone 9 europe absolutely completely different types of weather patterns soil insects plants even i get a lot of questions from people all around the world asking about how to grow certain plants and many times they're plants i've never even heard of and like i say it's the same challenges we all have so someone may have a plant in india or africa and they're asking me how to grow that plant. I can't answer that question, but I can help motivate. I can help with the basic information because all plants have the same basic needs and all we gardeners have the same basic processes of gardening. And that's how we can all help each other out. And, and as you learn to a new, or as you move to a new area, there's a lot to learn. But the basics are still there and the basics are still the same for for what we're doing with gardening. Lama Lama says gardening has helped me learn to quickly pivot when an obstacle presents itself. Fantastic. I take the emotion out and just try to look at it logically. Good. If I'm having trouble, there's something I'm missing. I love that approach. I love that idea of just stopping, looking around, thinking investigating and often especially and it, it works better with experience but often the answer is right there you just have to find it but you have to be willing to slow down to make that pivot to take the emotion out and to try to think of it logically so yes i completely agree with you that's one of those things where the lessons in the garden can carry you through to the lessons that you need in life Formulas is adding, do you actually set up a plan for turnips? I just broadcasted a whole bed of turnips. I, I do it pretty much the same as I do with my other plants. I was working with my beets over the weekend. And so like with the beets, the turnips are a, a bulb root. And so my plan is a section of a bed laid out and then putting the seeds in so that those bulbs have enough room to grow. So I plant in a grid. I don't broadcast and then thin. I actually put the seeds in at equal spacing in the grid. And, and so that's how I do it. That's, that works well for me. I don't grow so many turnips. In fact, I'm not growing turnips this year. But in, in years past, I'll grow four or five rows of turnips <clears throat> with eight to ten turnips in each row roughly and and that's it that's all the turnips I'm putting in so because it's only one section of my garden 
It's not really square foot gardening, but the same basic idea where I'm taking a section and I'm putting those seeds to fit that section and, and then go from there. But broadcasting, there's nothing wrong with that. That just, after they pop up, you go back, you thin out the plants and get the spacing you're looking for. So um, same results, but yeah, we just tend to do things a little bit differently, it looks like. So I, I, I'm more of a planned spacing kind of seeder when I, when I put my plants in the ground. Sherry says, has everyone here who have monarchs seen them on their milkweed and other host plants? I don't. I haven't seen a monarch in years, but I'm still growing the milkweed. Mine are here in droves, and I feel so blessed. Good for you. I, I remember monarchs in my youth uh, when I lived in Nevada, but I haven't seen monarchs here in this area of Colorado. But I'm still hoping. We're kind of at the edge of their migratory route. And so, and no one else around me has milkweed or any reason to draw them in, but I'm hopeful. But I'm, I'm glad you're able to see them because that is a fantastic butterfly and it does warm the heart when you see those monarchs in your garden. Absolutely. So Frank says, I can smell my basil and peppermint across 50 feet past the smoke. There's a good reason to grow those kind of plants is I, I, I do the same thing. Uh, I have my basil and peppermint, and there are some mornings in the, the, the still of the air with just a light breeze. And if you haven't done this, it's a good reason to go out early in the morning because it tends to really highlight your senses. But I can smell my garden as I approach it, absolutely. And the mint in one section and the basil in another section definitely makes a difference. And I've got my basil tower, my green stock tower that's just outside my back door. And there are mornings that I'll walk out with Mala and just be hit by that huge fragrance of, of the basil to start the morning. So good for you. That is a, a nice thing to, to have with, especially if you're having to confront the smoke, let the garden take your aroma away. Alora, hello. Someone I know sprays pesticides all over, and I try to not spray. My garden is full of pollinators, and his is dead, but he still tells me how I should spray. Drives me crazy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, I don't like to tell anyone that they're wrong with their gardening. I like to say that there might be a better way to do it and then present the better way. But ultimately, people are going to do what they're going to do. And and when you've got your big, beautiful garden that you can enjoy with the butterflies and all the other insects and the hummingbirds are coming to visit you and not your neighbor, I, it's it ultimately comes down to you can sit, enjoy, stand, watch, learn, and you're doing it the way that you want to do it and happy with that. So good for you. I don't, I don't think spray needs to be used especially if you're killing the pollinators but there are a lot of people that do that so i i fully understand why it drives you crazy but keep doing what makes you happy and i i'm sure that you will have much better moments in your garden than a neighbor who makes it so artificial and it is you know i i again it's one of those the the, the critic telling you how you should do things when you can see that your way is working better it's okay there's no reason to start an argument or a fight just keep doing what makes you happy and ultimately that's what it all comes down to tennessee nana says there's a lot of medical and scientific studies about the benefits of going barefoot it's called earthing or grounding i started going barefoot as i go outside really starting to feel better. Absolutely. And some of those same studies also talk about it's just the skin contact and with the soil. And and actually, I, I depends on where I'm gardening and what I'm doing. But I try to garden as much as possible without gloves for the same reason. It's earthing. It's getting your hands in the earth. And, and you're right. There are studies that, that definitely show a positive mental benefit but there are some studies that actually show a physical benefit that can result because of the exposure the, to the microbes 
and and the um, connection with your skin. So I'm I'm past the days of walking around barefoot much in in my area. I got too many rocks and sticks, but uh, I do love using the bare hands. So, but you're you're exactly right. There are studies that do say that that is one of those things that can make a difference. And I suspect there'll be a lot more of those studies coming out in the years ahead. So Eva says, I always plan so meticulously, but without fail, when I go to seed, the plan just goes out the window and I'm just broadcasting and over planting everywhere. So yeah, that's, <clears throat> I do both. I, I do plan when I seed, I do try to put the seed out in the order that I've got planned. But yes, yes, there are times when broadcasting, that you, you may have noticed that in the video that I just did about the, the cover crops. For, for some seeds, yeah, I just broadcast and over plant and don't worry too much about it. So you can be selective if you choose to, or just do everything over broadcasting and then thinning out later. There's, there, again, there's no right way and wrong way as long as it, you're out in the garden and doing what you want to do, it actually works out pretty darn well from my perspective. Sherry says, when I take my dog out at first light, we often greet deer. My dog can smell them. I can't, but we hold back out of love and respect. They watch us and then dance away. No hurry. Yeah, that's that's fun. Mala, Mala depending on where they're at, there are some days we'll walk out and usually the deer are in my neighbor's yard and in that case we'll watch we'll, we'll walk and watch but if the deer come in my yard mala tends to be a little more protective and barking and they will usually run away though they have stood their ground and confronted mala's barking that's when i usually have to get involved to get them to jump over the fence but i agree with you and all of nature from this perspective i've uh, have noticed that the, the hummingbirds in my garden are actually most active first thing in the morning. So when I walk out and see the hummingbirds feeding on the flowers or on my, my hummingbird feeder, I don't go out into the garden so that I don't disturb them and just watch them from the deck. And that, that is one of those enjoyable kind of things where you can appreciate and respect nature and let it work at its pace and you work at your pace and you will let you will allow their their space and it all works out so it, it works good blue petunias am i crazy for never using fertilizer never using pesticides and letting pests run their course most of the time i don't think you're crazy so you see that my garden behind me i don't have fertilizers in any of these beds i don't use pesticides in any of these beds and you see all these yellow sunflowers popping up. Those are, are naturalized. Those aren't seeds that I allow to grow. And so even in my pathways, I have flowers, I have plants that are technically weeds, but I'm allowing them to grow and just working with nature. So I don't think you're crazy at all because not only am I not using fertilizer and not using pesticides, but I let my weeds grow and I let the pests go. Because as I've learned, if in this whole area, except for the damage that these plants have from the hail, there's no insect damage. There's no bugs eating my plants because I have the predatory wasps and I have the lace wings and I have the ladybugs. I haven't seen one this year, but in years past, I have praying mantids in my garden and they take care of those pests. So I don't think it's crazy at all. It's it's the way I do it, but that's just one way of gardening. We all have our own ways of doing it and whatever makes you happy. I just try to demonstrate as much as possible in my videos that you don't have to use fertilizer and you don't have to use pesticides, but, but I'm, I really don't want to be that critic to tell you that it's wrong it's just a different choice in the way we garden. Hi, Jay. After 19 years in this community garden, the best way to give gardening advice is when people come to me after seeing a very successful garden plot. Absolutely. That is often the, the best 
discussion. It's just showing what you can do with the way you do it and the accomplishments you have. And it kind of speaks for itself. So I definitely like that idea. DJ the Hawk, hey to you. Should I be removing ripe butternut squashes from my plant in order to encourage more production or leave it until fall? No, remove them. Removing melons, squashes, tomatoes, pretty much all of your fruits in the garden, removing them will promote more growth. The, the way the plants basically work is, is the vegetable gardens we have in our plants are annuals. They have a life cycle. We start from seed, they flower and fruit and die. And sometimes they die from age, sometimes they die from the weather, but it's a, it's a short life. And so th that plant is trying to propagate as part of its short life. And when it sets fruit, it starts getting into propagation mode because the fruit has the seeds for the next generation. So if you leave the squash on the plant and that squash begins to mature and actually get overripe, the plant is saying, oh, good, made it through another season. I have set my seeds in place. I'm done. If you harvest the squash, the plant's like, wait, wait, what happened to all my seeds? I need to grow more flowers and grow more fruit because I need to propagate. And so that's basically how it works. The more you harvest, the more it generates new plants, or not new plants, new fruits. And so you can see this. I mentioned it in my cucumber video of a couple years ago. <coughs> With a cucumber plant, it becomes very obvious because the cucumber fruit will grow large and turn yellow. But if you have a cucumber plant that is not producing new fruit, go down to the base of the plant and you may find one of those old gnarly big yellow cucumbers hidden underneath the leaves. Because once that cucumber forms, it signals to the rest of the plant that it doesn't need to work as hard to send out the new fruit. So. Uh, yeah, butternut squashes can last for months <coughs> in storage and after being harvested. So there's really no reason to keep them on the plant once they reach that point that they are ripe. And you may, depending on how long your season is, you may be able to get some more butternut squashes later on, or at least the little ones that are on the plant have more energy to, to grow and get bigger and then also get to the point that you can harvest them before the end. Masabi gal is wondering, what's a good way and time to start a patch of meadow in one's yard? So uh, this, I showed some of it in some videos of a few years ago. <coughs> it's, it depends on the, the, the seeds you're growing. I'm assuming you want to grow native plants and perennial plants. And most of those need some exposure to the weather and, and the, the cold temperatures and you know often we'll do the the stratification is what it's called in the refrigerator if we buy the packet of seed and the packet will say put in the refrigerator for 30 to 60 days before germination and so that's our artificial way of doing it but if you want to do it naturally you take those seeds and expose them to your winter conditions so i think the best way, the easiest way, and for me it's worked out pretty successfully, is to sow the seeds in fall, mid to late fall, when it's cold enough that they're not going to germinate, and then leave them in place over the winter. And they will be naturally stratified, and if they need scarification, some seeds actually need that, that exposure to the elements to help break down the seed coating so that they can germinate. Then in spring, when the soil temperature is right and when the weather is right, those seeds are going to germinate. And now you have the beginnings of a meadow. That's, that's how meadows form naturally. They drop the seeds in, in early fall, typically. Those seeds stay in place over the winter and then they sprout up again in spring. And so if you recreate that basic cycle, you can easily have a, a patch of meadow in your yard. And so in my pollinator garden, that's that's exactly what I've done over the last couple of years is just 
the first year I just broadcast seed that I wanted to grow and much of it popped up in the following spring and then last year I collected the seeds from the flower heads of the plants that were successful and then broadcast them in new areas and this year I've got zinnias that are popping up everywhere in that section of my garden in that in that pollinator garden area they're just starting to flower they're so beautiful but by broadcasting those zinnia seeds in uh, in late fall uh, and even early winter it you just just don't want them germinating and they often need to be exposed to the cold anyway uh it's it's an easy way to to, to make it happen it takes time i mean we're talking a couple years for this all to fully develop but that's an easy way to do it and it, and it is pretty effective hello willie scott i have my carrots and other cold weather plants planted via grid pattern cool i hate the waste of overseeding as well as thinning do you mind thinning i i don't mind thinning um but like you i don't I don't like thinning if I don't need to thin. And so that's one reason why I, I do the grid pattern because I, I come from a background in life where I couldn't afford seed and I didn't like the idea of wasting seed. So I only planted as much seed as was needed to grow because that left me more seed for later. But if you don't mind overseeding, sure, you can go for it and you can thin it. But, but personally, I, I'm like you. I, I prefer to do the grid pattern and I don't overseed because, yeah, I, I also see it as a bit of a waste. Carrots are a little more difficult. I do tend, and lettuce, uh, small seeds like that, I do tend to broadcast lettuce and then thin it out later. And I'm not as precise with my carrots and then I'll thin it out later. But except for those really small seeds that are difficult to put into a specific grid. All the rest, I'm, I'm spacing and planning and measuring to try to get them to where I want them to be. <clears throat> and so Bud's saying, what cultivar of sunflowers is that in your garden? I've been trying to find a shorter variety. So I don't know. This is, this is a, a naturally occurring sunflower in this part of Colorado. And what I did when I first moved in is I had some of these flowers pop up. And the same thing I was, that we were just talking about with creating a meadow is I just started collecting those seeds and broadcasting them around in that first year I was here. And now I don't even worry about it. Between the birds and the wind and these sunflowers popping up, they're everywhere. But this is just a, some native Colorado sunflower that grows wild. And I probably should try to figure out if I can identify what variety it might be. Uh, but if you can find something that's that's native or naturalized in your area, you could do the same thing. You can take the seed and and allow it to grow. So sorry, but I don't have a specific answer for you uh, because I'm just letting nature figure out which flowers are going to grow best in my garden. And this is one of those things that I'm I'm actually having some good success with when you work with nature and put the plants in that 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 nature is telling you, hey, I'm doing this on purpose. These plants grow well in your terrible soil, so give them a chance. And I'm like, okay, I'll go for it. Love and peace. Hello to you. This is my second year of vegetable gardening. Congratulations. You and this wonderful group have kept me motivated, especially with this challenging year. Let's continue to be gladiators. Thank you for those wonderful words. Yeah, absolutely. Especially the second year, I think it may be one of the most challenging years for gardeners. There are a lot of people that want to garden, especially new homeowners or, or recent retirees who have never really gardened before, and now they're getting to do it. And in the first year, there's usually some pretty good success rates, a little bit of failure, but in that first year, it's like the honeymoon phase. Everything just l looks great and feels great, and you're so happy that you're a gardener. But in the second year, that's when things that may have gone wrong the first year that you didn't notice really start taking center stage. And when you really start seeing the effects of the weather and the insects and poor soil and everything else, 
And so when I've talked to former gardeners in the past, because I've been at a number of events over the years where I'm at the table representing the garden group and someone comes up and says, yeah, I used to garden, but, and it's usually that they gave up at about the second year because it just didn't work out for them. So good for you to keep going and moving forward and getting the the enthusiasm that you have because uh, the second year is a tough year. And if you can make it into year three or four, then you're set. You're, you're going to be gardening. So we'll be here for you that whole time. Kathy says, most of my neighbors aren't gardening either. I think it depends more on time. I didn't have a garden for 20 years. Figured I didn't have time. But it depends on what you plant. Absolutely. And and that's that, there's so much about gardening. We Everyone can be a gardener if they choose to. It's just you're, the balance of your time. I, I have some other things, of course, that keep me occupied. And I know all of you have other things in your life. But I look at people I've known over the years and 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 they've said the same kind of thing. Oh, I don't have time to garden, but they'll spend 20 hours a week restoring an old car or they'll spend 10 hours on the weekend to go out and shoot their bow, bow and arrow or shoot their gun or or whatever else that they like to do great activities. It's just the choices we make of how we're going to use our time. And I use my time on the weekend and during the week, even when I was working full time and it's, it's focused on gardening. And so that that's one of those things that uh, it is challenging, especially like you say, didn't have a garden for 20 years. But once you figure out that you can, even starting small with just a couple plants, then you start getting the bug and you can hope that it stays with you like some of us for decades. Alora says, do you know of a beneficial insect that preys on Japanese beetles? They're my biggest pest and I want to handle them naturally, but nothing seems to eat them from my experience. Yeah, the and, and if someone else has an answer, by all means, jump in. But from what I've read on the Japanese beetle, it doesn't have uh, the natural predator like a, like an aphid would or a lot of the caterpillars that are in our garden. <clears throat> the thing about Japanese beetles, and I've talked about this recently as well, is learning the life cycle of the, the pest and trying to figure out where you can break the life cycle with how they overwinter, how they lay their eggs, how they eat, when they emerge, all those kind of things. When you can figure out the life cycle, it helps you break the cycle so that they become less of a problem. And then traps. Traps are often the, the, the best way to deal with some of those pests to reduce their numbers. So between using traps and trying to figure out a way to break their life cycle so that they're not a problem for you, that's about the best natural way to, to deal with uh, any any type of pest like that. But Japanese beetles can be a little more challenging because they're they're not being eaten by the birds and I'm not aware of a wasp that's going to come in and, and deal with them either. So um, it, it definitely can be a challenge. So Derek says, don't you want the winter squash to mature so that it stays good all winter? Yes, absolutely. Let it mature on the plant. But once it matures, once it's ripe, harvest it and it will continue to to store well for months. Leaving it on the plant after it's reached that full maturity might actually shorten its storage time if it continues to be exposed to weather. Because once it, reach, it reaches the right point, and one of the ways to tell is to look at the stem where the, the squash connects to the vine, and it'll begin to brown. It, it says, I'm done, and it'll actually stop sending energy to that squash plant. And a, if you're going to store your squash, it's better to store it in a cool, dark, dry pantry than it is to, to store it outside, exposed to the rain and the sun and animals that might want to eat it. So, so that's the key difference as to harvesting the squash, is harvesting it when it's ripe on the plant 
and not necessarily leaving it on the plant for star storage. But uh, yeah, let it mature, but let it mature on the plant and then take it off the plant. And hopefully that'll promote the, the new growth that you're actually looking for. Shandy's Garden is asking, is it okay to store seeds in the refrigerator on a regular basis, on a constant basis? I want to know if it will harm. I guess it depends on how dry it stays. So refrigerators are generally pretty dry. That's one of the things about storing in a refrigerator is that humidity tends to be a little bit low in, in the refrigerator. And there's really nothing wrong with storing seeds in the refrigerator. I do a lot of uh, that stratification. So those flower seeds that I'm planning on starting in late winter to grow into plants to then transplant into my garden. And I, I do a lot of that throughout my landscape is start plants from seed and then put them into the areas I want them to be. I store those seeds in the refrigerator because they require that cold exposure for them to germinate. But depending on how many seeds you have, if you've seen my seed videos, I've got way too many seeds to store them in the refrigerator. So that is really, I think, a bigger issue is how much space do you have in your refrigerator to store seeds? And if you don't have enough space, then you need to be selective and only storing the seeds that can benefit from the cold is really necessary. Pretty much all the vegetable seeds that we're growing don't need that cold and they really don't benefit from the refrigerator you might gain a year or two of storage time if you store them in the refrigerator, but most of our seeds are going to be used up before they go bad, and you're going to either save new seeds or buy new seeds. So you don't need to gain that extra little bit of time by storing them in the refrigerator. But, but unless you have a really wet and humid environment and your refrigerator is moist, then it's no potential for harm. It's cool and it's dark and it's usually dry. And so, yes, it makes a pretty good storage place for, for the, your seeds if you've got the, the room in the refrigerator to store your seeds. So uh, completely up to you. I'm just not so, uh, how, how should I say this? Um, I, I, I buy too many seeds and I save too many seeds. And so, I'm, I'm not so conservative in the number of seeds I have that I could even think about putting them in the refrigerator unless I had a dedicated uh, refrigerator for my seeds, but I'm not going to do that. John Jude says, I'm 72 and hopefully I'll always have at least tomatoes and peppers. I'm trying to learn the easiest way to garden. You might do a video for a handicap. So I do have that planned. It, and. And you've seen it in some of my videos in my enclosed garden area. I've got two metal beds and one of those metal beds is a high bed. It's 32 inches tall. And the reason I got that was specifically to, to, to use in a video about gardening with the, the physical limitations that you have with age or with some type of handicap. So yes, John, it's in my plan. I just haven't got to it yet. And there are other things that I plan to, to discuss in that video as well. So thank you for keeping that at the forefront and reminding me, um, be, but it is on the list of, of videos that I'm planning to do right now. Um, I had hoped to get it done this year, but our crazy spring weather just didn't fit with the, my plan. And so I'm planning to, to shoot it and talk about it early next year as a like beginning of gardening season video, probably in like the, the March or April time frame. So uh, it's, it's on my list, it's on my plan, and hopefully you'll see it uh, coming up in the months ahead. So um, let's hope the weather cooperates. I like to, I have certain things that I want to show in videos like that. And when the weather doesn't cooperate, I just move that video to a new time, to either a new month and sometimes to a new year. 
Severin Koski, I'm dealing with anthracnose the last two years. Tomatoes and peppers are ruined. I cannot find info to rid it in a small garden. So the, the thing about anthracnose, and this holds true with verticillium wilt and a lot of those other tomato diseases. They, there's a couple ways to approach this. So one, and, and you can, I think I mentioned this in one of my seed videos, but you can find the information easily on the, on the internet, is look for varieties that are resistant to the, to the diseases. And so on a plant tag or on a seed packet or at the, the, the bigger seed websites, they have codes that will tell you what the, the plants are resistant to when it comes to very specific diseases. So, so that's one option is to try to grow varieties that are resistant to particular diseases. The, the thing about getting rid of it is once you have, and this holds true with bacterial diseases, fungal de diseases, and viral diseases that are affecting our peppers and tomatoes is they're in the soil. They're going to keep coming back and it's, it's almost impossible to get rid of them in a short period of time. The bacteria, the microbes in the soil will eat that bacteria and those fungi and the viruses. So over time, they become food for other microbes. It just often takes time. And so depending on the disease, it could be three years, it could be five years. That's, that's one reason to rotate your crops. So if you have an area that you know diseased plants have grown in, try to avoid growing those same plants in that same bed. Don't stop growing in that bed because those microbes need to be alive, to do their job, to help dissipate the diseases that might be residing in the soil. And so a small garden becomes challenging, especially if you want to grow plants like tomatoes. But you've identified a spot, you've identified a problem, and at, for at least the next three years, don't grow tomatoes and peppers in that bed. And you may need to find out other methods like growing in five gallon buckets or grow bags or another area of your garden but that's kind of how you, you have to deal with diseases that become uh, prevalent in a particular garden bed is you just have to stay away from it. So anthracnose in particular, you know, might be infecting those plants, but there's a lot of other plants that you can grow that aren't affected by anthracnose. So you grow those plants in that bed for the next three years or more, and then you can put a tomato plant in and see how well it does. And uh, it's there's a lot of patience involved. This is why gardeners are warriors, because it takes a lot of patience. It takes educating and learning, and you've got to put it all into practice. So that's that's really the, the way to get rid of it. And the reason you can't find a way to get rid of it is because there really isn't something that you can pour on the soil that's just going to deal with that one disease. It takes time. You got to let the, the, the natural elements get rid of it. And it's the soil. It's the healthy soil that really will, will save the day. But it takes a few years for, for that to reach the point that it isn't a problem anymore. Willie says, I used to fret over weeds in my self-made compost starting the second year. Now I'm only weeding here and there and mulch every bed I have in the ground and in waking tulips. There you go. So yeah, that's that's kind of the approach I take is I only I only weed in my vegetable garden beds for the most part. I, I, I mean, I do some weeding around my, my perennial plants if the weeds are interfering with what I want the plants to, to be doing. Uh, but good for you. I, I, I like that natural approach as well. It is one of the things that uh, it's a philosophy of how you choose to garden. And I'm okay with things like sunflowers popping up all over. Mrs. CC, hello. How do you get rid of ants in your garden or are they beneficial? Well, first off, I don't get rid of ants in my garden because I do consider them beneficial. Now, 
If they're fire ants and if they're causing a problem, that's a completely different issue. And especially for fire ants, about the only way to get rid of them is with chemicals. But the general ant that we see crawling around, I'm okay with that. I have a very compacted, poor soil in my landscape. And so the ants are burrowing into the soil, which helps decompact it. And then by using mulch and allowing the, the plants to grow naturally, they die in the winter and they begin to decompose and they'll fill up those ant burrows. So that's one way to slowly improve your soil over time is to let the burrowing insects like ants and beetles and earthworms do some of the work for you. So that's the approach I take is I don't try to get rid of them. If they are a problem, you can do use things like borax and vinegar. There are a lot of scent based products because the ants will walk on their trails and they're using their pheromones. They're using their ant scent to direct where the other ants are going to go. And so if you can screw up with their little ant noses, then you can, can direct them into other areas. And there's some other things. I've actually read of a study showing that boiling water in an ant mound had about a 50%, I think it was 40 to 60, I think was the number success rate. So there are other things to do. But for me in my garden, I, I don't get rid of the ants because I do consider them beneficial. They are helping to decompose the organic matter that I've got in and on my soil. And so the reason I'm adding compost and I'm using mulch is so that it benefits the soil. And, and something like an ant is all part of that process. So that's, that's the approach I take with the, the, uh, with the ants and with most of the insects in the area. Sherry says the Japanese beetle traps do break the cycle as it captures them during the mating behavior so they don't drop down into the soil. Traps need to be changed and disposed of often. Thank you for that, Sherry. That's, that's good to hear that substantiation, yeah. Traps can, can be good for a lot of things like that. It's, it's um, uh, yeah, the mating is an important part of the life cycle that if you can disrupt that, you can eliminate an entire generation or more of, you know, multiple generations depending on the insect. So uh, that's definitely a good way to approach it. It's, uh, <clears throat> I think, the, the whole world kind of operates with that basic concept when it comes to moving on when propagating. Severin saying, thank you. It's all, it's in all my beds. We figured we would have to rebuild elsewhere on the property. So uh, good, glad to, glad to help out there. And so nice to see everybody here today. I, I, I see so many of the names that that are here on a regular basis, but then I see new names that pop up and it's so nice to have the, the new names pop up. Green Leaf Gardening. Do you have any tips for small gardening YouTubers for live streams? So, uh, yeah, I'll give you my tips. This is how I approach my live streams. I've been doing this for a few years now. I think that that it's important to make a a video or a live stream that you would want to watch. And so that's the approach I take with most of what I do. And what I like to see is a person who is prepared. So you've probably figured this out with my many live streams is I treat my Monday live streams just like I treat a video and I treat my videos seriously. I do research, I do planning, I do the shooting and the editing and all the different steps that are necessary so that I can produce as high a quality video as I can. And, it, and it's always improving. You compare my videos now to my older videos and I'm much prouder of my newer videos. But that's all part of the progression is just to keep doing it, progress and get better. But especially with a live stream, prepare. I've got my sheet of notes here. I have certain things I want to say and that's all planned ahead of time. There, are, all of us have seen those live streams, those live YouTube shows that they're, they just ramble and I'm not a rambler and, and that's 
what you I think for any small YouTuber looking to try a live stream is figure out what it is you want to do. If you want to just ramble, then go for it. But recognize that the audience you're going to get is probably going to be different than an audience like ours that is trying to have a community and we're learning and we're asking questions and we're sharing information. And so with the Gardner Scott community, I think it is beneficial for all of us that I come prepared with specific information to share. That's the approach I take. When you identify what you are trying to accomplish, then, then go for that. There are other gardening uh, live streams out there that, that run the range. And are you going to do it by yourself? Or are you going to do it with someone else? I'd like to have uh, visitors, the guests from time to time just to break it up. But there are other live streams that are two people doing the live stream. And, and it's a completely different dynamic when you have a conversation going on as part of the live stream, as opposed to what we do, which is you only hear me speaking. So that's something to look at. Is it just you or do you want to have someone else involved? And do you want other people to be involved? There are, are a number of live streams out there that they never respond to the comments. They're just talking to each other or presenting whatever it is they're going to present. And there's no live questions. I like the live questions, so I add that in. So whichever approach you want, there's there's some good YouTubers out there, big garden channels, and they do their live streams answering questions, but it's prepared questions. It's the questions that they got, and then they do their live stream to answer the questions that they already got. So it's it's a different approach. I like to do do this the way we do it where i can look at you and you can share with your words what you're thinking or what you're asking and it is the approach i take with that preparation and with that practice over time and and if you figure out a basic idea to begin with try it and then see how it works and then modify that and see how it works you know, the background, I think I'm the only one that's doing the green screen background where we talk about other people's gardens and it's different each week. Even when it's my garden, it's it's something that you can see and talk about. So if there's something that is unique that you want to try, go for it. And and don't let anyone tell you that you should you, you just be yourself. I guess that's the best advice I can give. And this holds true with all videos and live streams. Just be yourself. And not everyone will like you. You have to accept that. But there's people out there that will and that will watch and that will appreciate for what you're doing. Hey, Willie, on a lighter note, how many gardeners have you seen spend more on garden barriers than the actual beds? I did. I have a spunky husky and labradane like that digging or that like digging. Oh, yes, absolutely. I don't show it, it occasionally. You can see it in the background. I usually try to crop her out, but in in many of my videos, there's Mala in the background digging, and I I had a house, had a, a chocolate lab, lovely dog, my best friend ever in the garden, and I spent a lot of time building a fence and fencing in my garden to keep her out because I didn't like the digging, and then. I, you know, I look back now and think, uh, that I, I wish I had spent more time with her in the garden with me because she was just such a fantastic job. Uh, you're exactly right. I've seen that all over with people. It's um, probably one of the, the best examples. I visited a garden in Washington State that was fully enclosed. It had chain link fence up the sides, chain link fence across the top. Thousands of dollars must have been spent to fence in that garden. And it was a pretty big garden to keep the animals out. And my thought was that the expense to do that was so outrageous that it far outweighed the plants that would be lost in a typical season or a system that wasn't quite so expensive. But 
yeah, I, 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 I like sharing my garden with my pets and especially Mala as a, a, a mouser and she's caught a couple gophers this year. She's doing a great job keeping some of those pests out, but she destroys it in the process. One of the reasons it, 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 it makes sense to me, at least all of these uh, cattle panel hoops I have over my bed, they, they do serve a big purpose so I can cover them with hail cloth or shade cloth or bird netting or whatever I need to do to help protect my plants. But I think the primary reason why I've got them on all my beds, even the beds that don't have any soil in them, is to keep Mala out of my beds because I, when she was still new and I had a bed that wasn't covered, she jumped up in the bed and was digging for gophers that were probably burrowing far below. So I, I don't think you need to spend a lot of money and time on those kind of barriers if you just learn to live with them and everything seems to be okay. So uh, I living with your pests as opposed to constantly fighting your pests is a little bit easier. Yeah, it, how, how much of a, a fighter do you want to be? How much of a gladiator in the arena are you going to be? Do you want to fight the lion or you, do you want to lie with the lamb? And that's kind of the way I approach a lot of how I set up my garden. So Sherry's saying, I've spent money on keeping my um, briard in. He's a herding breed and is always looking for something to herd and protect. So uh, yeah, exactly. That's one of those things that it it's a a balance of what we're going to do and how much we want to spend but it's it's whatever makes you happy and whatever you can afford and whatever works best for you so uh always always nice to see that always nice to see you here brian thank you for that contribution just wanted to thank gardener scott for bringing so many wonderful people together well thank you brian and you know i'm i'm just one part of this this formula this equation you all are are here as well so thank you to all of you for being part and being together and being wonderful people and absolutely this is one of those things that i could do this al alone i wouldn't have done over 170 live streams if no one was watching so it is beneficial to have other people out there but but I would keep doing this if it was a, a much smaller group. We just we did a, a members only live stream last week, and it was actually the, the biggest we've had. There were I think there were 22 people on at one time. Most of the time I get together for the members only live streams, and there might be six or seven or 12 of us. And so I like doing this regardless of how big or small the group is. I'm I'm always willing to help people out and to talk gardening with other people who garden so i think it's fun to have that opportunity and you all make it happen as well so thank you brian and thank you for all the rest of you that are also saying thank you to brian and thank you to gardening with caitlin thanks and have a great day i hope you have a great day I hope you have a great week great month season's not over yet so i hope all of us have a fantastic end of the season or uh, for those of you who it's early morning and you'll be watching tomorrow on the replay in Australia or Chile or South Africa uh, or New Zealand. I know there are viewers from all parts of, of the other side of the planet. So I hope you have a great start to your season to all of the, those of you who are starting. But yes, let's begin with today, like Caitlin is suggesting. And I appreciate that. I am planning on having a great day. It, it looks to be good. The temperatures are cooling a little bit. We actually got a little bit of rain, actually a lot of rain yesterday, which is going to work well because I'm going to be filming a video tomorrow and I, I watered really well yesterday to prepare for that video, but the rain is definitely going to help. So it's a great day already. And Mala and I have already been outside taking pictures, walking the garden, and got a lot planned this week. So... I, I got to figure out, this is, I talk about food preserving, and I encourage, if you haven't got into preserving your harvest, to definitely think about it and start learning more about it. 
because I'm, I'm at that point now with my cherry tomatoes, particularly the black cherries, is I have more than I can eat. And even sharing them, I'm harvesting more than I can eat and share. So my plan this afternoon, with like the video I made a little while back, is to freeze dry my tomatoes. I'm so glad I got that freeze dryer because that gives me something to do with those tomatoes to make delicious snacks in the future. But I've also started harvesting some cucumbers. And this weekend, put up two quarts of pickles that are fermenting right now. So this is such a wonderful time as the crops are coming in. You can't eat enough, but preserving them is always a great option. And try to get as much as possible done before the season ends. And when you preserve, you can enjoy the harvest much later. Willie, your grade 80 in my book, Gardener Scott. Appreciate your live streams. Thank you, Willie. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And Barry says, thank you for all you do. Support the Gardener Scoot community. Um, Scoot is what my mother used to call me. <coughs> and your YouTube garden videos are awesome, too. Thank you for that, Barry. I appreciate it. You know, it's, it's fun. It's one of those things that I enjoy doing. And like I said, I like most beginning YouTubers, the small channels, I was making videos when there was nobody there to watch. And I still made videos, you know, hoping that it would be something people were interested in. And it turned out to be that way. So it's one of those things we all like to find the, the things in life that make us happy, but also have a benefit for others. So thank you for those kind words. It's definitely something that is keeping me happy and keeping me getting up every day and going outside. And so, let's see, Tree Roji is saying, I know it's my worst season for sunflowers ever. They all break or turn black and other no seeds. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, this is one of those uh, great opportunities. And so th this holds true, not with just sunflowers, but, but all plants. In the off season, at the end of the season, try to figure out what went wrong and why it went wrong. It's the why that's the most important thing to try to figure it out for next year. So when they break and turn black, I'm guessing it's either a weather event or it's a soil problem. That's the, the most likely cause. It could be the type, the varieties that, that you're trying to grow. They're not, they don't match with the weather and the soil. Um, but, but this is a great chance to do some research and see if it's only in one area if it's everywhere, if it's everywhere, then it then it's weather or soil related probably. If it's only one spot, then you can narrow it down and try to figure out it might be contaminated soil. That that could definitely be an issue in with plants not doing well in one spot. I remember, I think it was when I was going through the Master Gardener program, but but whoever the, the speaker was was talking about a garden. And there was one spot that never grew plants well. And they kept trying, they did different things, fertilizers, all kinds of things, and nothing ever grew. And so this, this person, I'll assume they're the one that actually figured it out because they're the ones that were telling the story. So they dug down into the soil because they figured out it had to be the soil. Everything else was the same throughout the garden. It was just that one spot that things weren't growing well. And they began to dig down and like six or eight inches under the ground, there was like the hood of a car that was buried in the ground. So they were only growing in just a few inches of soil with this big metal plate that was basically blocking all of the roots. And so you never know what the problem is until you start doing some of that investigation. And it might mean digging down into the soil to find out why the plants aren't going as well as they should. And it could be something that's buried it, or a contamination that's in that soil that is affecting all the plants that are growing. So that's the craziness of gardening is you never know. And, and it could be something somebody did years and years before that's influencing your garden now. 
<clears throat> Sherry saying thanks for the encouragement about starting YouTube. I'm teetering on the edge of starting on the aging process. I just don't I just need to get over being perfect from day one. Absolutely. You know, I've I've been a bit of a perfectionist in my life and even in the beginning tried to be as good as I thought I needed to be and it wasn't as good. And that's that's really what you got to do. You just got to do it. If, if you want to start making videos, start making videos. The thing that, that it, it's, it's something that we don't typically think about, but it's so true. You got to make more videos to get better at making videos, but we, we don't start making videos because we're worried about the criticism. We're worried about that critic who's never gardened before. And certainly they've never made a YouTube video before. And they're criticizing us on the videos that we're making. But more likely, no one's going to see that video. The first video that you make, you're probably going to have 8 or 12 views. And those 8 or 12 people are going to be your family and friends that are going to be polite and watch your video. So it doesn't matter how good or how bad it is, it's not going to go viral. It's not going to be seen by millions of people. And so don't take this the wrong way, but it's not going to matter. What it matters is to get you started, to get you learning about how to film, how to edit, how to post, have to, how to deal with people not watching it. And then you make another one. And hopefully the second one will be, get, will be seen by 25 people. And some of those people will be new people. And that's how you start building your community. That's how you start building the the viewers and then you do a third video and then you do a fourth video there are a lot of channels out there some really good channels that tell you how to build a youtube channel and how to make your videos and how to edit and how to get your audience lots of good advice definitely if you're thinking about doing a youtube channel seek out some of those channels that will help you in that direction but depending on who you watch, I think it was Think Media, which is a great channel for those kind of things. I was watched a video a number of years ago, and I think in one of the, their discussions, they were saying, you need to make a hundred videos before you get good at it and before people discover your channel. And then there's another one out there, um, Roberto Blake did a video and he was saying 150 to 200. You need to make 150 to 200 videos before you get discovered and before your videos are good enough that you'll be discovered. Now, for me, I got relatively lucky in this gardening community. It was video number 75 for me where I, at that point, was like, okay, I think I have this figured out and my videos improved and started getting more and more views. So don't think this is going to happen quickly. You've got to put in the time. You've got to put in the effort. And it starts with that first video that you're not going to think is very good. No one's going to see. But by the time you get to number 75 or 100 or 200, depending on how serious you are about doing this, then you'll have your audience then you'll feel better about what you're doing and hopefully you've stayed with it that whole time. It was, so I started YouTube 11 years ago, I think it is now, and I just made a few videos, a handful of videos, then didn't do videos for a few years, then did another handful, then didn't do videos for a few years. I've only been serious about these YouTube videos for about five years now and so I, and I made a lot of videos in these last five years but the the thousand subscriber is the goal that so many channels want I need a thousand subscribers well it took me uh, six years I think it was it took me six years to reach that point where I had a thousand subscribers but that's because I wasn't as focused and I just had a few videos and I did some here and did some there. But just be aware that you should do YouTube if you want for yourself and for whatever purpose you want to do it, not to chase the subscribers, 
not to hit any certain milestones, but just to do it because you feel like you have something that you want to share with others. And if you approach it from that perspective, the viewers will follow, the growth will happen, and you might have a couple videos that take off and grow your channel. And before you know it, you've been doing it for 11 years and you have a pretty big channel. That's a lot of videos that other people can, can, can view. So uh, just be aware, I've, I've helped a number of my, my friends uh, get started with YouTube because they see what I'm doing and it sounds exciting. And none of them have made more than three or four videos. It takes work, it takes dedication, it takes effort. And so, you know, they tried, they started and realized it wasn't something that really interested them. Whereas my son actually has recently started his second YouTube channel. And so his, his first channel is the Brew Captain in his younger days where he, he chugged beer and did beer reviews. And that channel is actually relatively successful, but he's not making videos for it now. Now he's moving forward with Ready, Set, Homestead is his channel. And he's documenting his journey of having chickens and building a chicken coop and washing eggs and building a sawhorse and all the things that he's doing as he's learning to garden and learning to have chickens and learning to have turkeys and and that aspect that he's now moving forward in life it's a brand new channel doesn't have a lot of subscribers but that's not why he's doing it he's doing it more to document and then reach the point that yeah maybe he'll have success like he did with the other channel he's he's my the only close circle of friends and family i have who has recognized how much effort it takes and is trying to put forward that effort as much as possible. But he's got a growing family and a job and he may, if he's lucky, do two videos a month. So hope that helps those of you who are thinking about doing it. There, There is no set roadmap for success. You just gotta chug away at it and it will work out over time. If, if you're willing for it to work out over a time. And so, um, so yeah, Kriroji says, obviously you're doing something right. You got 360,000 subscribers. So yes, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, but a lot of it is just the learning and the dedication and the sticking with it and making it work. And so, hey, Jay, thanks for putting up that link to Ready, Set, Set Homestead. Uh, and that's him. It's the Ready, Set, Homestead USA is actually the 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 link site to it so appreciate that he's he's having fun with it it's always nice when you can see your your family who lives a thousand miles away and so that's one of the reasons i like to watch his his videos as well and then c john cj don is exactly right the more you record the better you get which makes editing easier as well absolutely so i enjoy it i think it's fun and i i i like the, the messages and the help and whatever it is I can offer to other people. Not everybody sees it the same way. Most people do based on the, the thumbs up I get, I get and the positive comments I get. Uh, and so I'll, I will keep doing it. And if you can do it and like doing it, then do it. Because it really is rewarding for me to spend every Monday with you all. Come on, how, how much more rewarding can you be in your week than to spend time with friends and people who know what you're talking about and have a conversation, even though it's me doing the talking and you doing the writing. I, this is just a fantastic option to do it. And so when I talk about that, that community and the friendship and the, and the conversations we have, I, I want to give a shout out to, to Deb that this week uh, actually happened twice. One with a volunteer that I used to work with at the Galileo Garden. But I was walking through the grocery store and a woman came up to me and said hello because she recognized me. And we we stood there and chatted for a few minutes and and she probably went home and said, I saw Gardner Scott at the store today. And I went home thinking, oh, that was just so fantastic that someone was willing to get out of their comfort mode and come up to me and say hello and say, 
that they recognized me. That was fantastic. I love that. If you ever see me out in public, come up to me and say hello. I really do like that. And it usually does work both ways. I've, I've had a number of people who I found out kind of behind the scenes how excited they were to see me. Well, I'm excited too. That's that's how Eli and Kate and I got to, to be friends is because I made a comment on one of their videos a couple years ago and she was so excited that I made a comment that she put it on Facebook and all of her social media. And I found out about that and now we're friends because of just that excitement she had and my excitement over her excitement and so I, I i i love that so please if you see me say hello and and we can both benefit from that camaraderie and this whole gardening group that we have because we're all in the arena we're all doing the battles and we're really the only ones that understand what it is to be a gardener and it is so special to be a gardener and all the things that we do all the things we accomplish all of the troubles and the failures but all of that turns us into the good people that we are and so give yourself a pat on the back this week and recognize that you really are someone special because you are a gardener and i hope i've helped get you in that moving in that direction and help you on the journey and i will continue to do that and this brings us to our close on this monday but we'll be back monday do it all over again have some of these wonderful conversations and get our gardening week started i'm gardener scott enjoy garden